I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin join me. We're talking to Bob Orban. That's next on This Week in Radio Tech. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 110, recorded December 14th, 2011. Bob Orban. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by the Telos Alliance and the astonishingly gorgeous Now Catalog. Featuring color pictures, diagrams, techie specs, and many words of modern radio wisdom. Telos will mail it to you for free, and you can download the PDF. Get yours at telosalliance.com slash now. Hello, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm your host, Kirk Harnack. If you've tuned into this show, you probably already know what it's about. It would be uh, Radio Tech. We're a bunch of engineers that get together uh, every uh, Wednesday at this time on the Twit Network and talk about the things that go into radio technology. It may be audio. Uh, it may be good audio or fixing bad audio. Uh, it, it, it may be uh, just assembling all the things that bring audio into a, 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 an audio facility, usually a radio station, and, uh, or maybe a, a netcaster like the folks at the Twit Network uh, who are also adding video to their work. Or it may have to do with things at the transmitter site, that is getting this uh, audio out to the masses of people um, that radio tends to touch. So um, without further ado, let me introduce my uh, co-hosts on the show. First of all, the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York, it's my friend, Chris Tobin. Make him feel welcome. Hello, Chris. <laughs> Hello, Kirk. I'm uh, doing well, and uh, New York City today is doing very better. A lot of dignitaries in town. Not sure why. But the radio folks here in town have been running around. The radio news folks are all over the place. So it's been a busy day. I'll bet. I'll bet. And uh, you uh, were, up until recently, we were uh, an engineer with the CBS radio stations. And I've, I know you've had just a ton of radio engineering, but now you've got a little bit different role in life. But still gives you a good perspective on broadcast engineering, though. Tell me about that quickly. Yes, uh, I've taken over the reins at uh, CCS Music Cam, codec manufacturer of uh, audio over IP and video over IP. And actually, I get to dabble even more now with radio folks. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun, both engineers and non-engineering types. And more um, IT people, interestingly enough, you know, changing hats and roles. So it's it's been fun. It's actually been it's really good. Oh yeah, years ago somebody told me, you know, in the future we won't have TV cameras anymore. We'll have computers that make TV pictures, and we won't have transmitters anymore. We'll have uh, computers that transmit. And it does seem like we have uh, we are certainly along that that direction. Uh, as we have audio processors, as we'll talk with uh, with our guest Bob Orban, uh, we'll we'll talk about computers that process audio. Also with us from the uh, northern hinterlands, out in the wild wild Midwest, uh, from Muckwanago, Wisconsin, it's Chris Tarr. Hi, Chris. Hello there. Yeah, we don't have any dignitaries here except for I think Miss Dairy Air stopped by earlier today, or you know, in Muckwanago. But uh, other than that, it's been pretty quiet. Uh, I am the uh, Director of Engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison and Milwaukee. Uh, I'm also a uh, contributing writer to Radio Guide magazine. Uh, Co-host uh, co the website, uh, The Virtual Engineer, at uh, broadcastengineering.info, and a whole lot of other things, as well as probably one of Bob Orban's biggest fans. All right. Well, I, you know, I think we're all Bob Orban fans here. I certainly got, got my start in the first stations that I worked at. Uh, had uh, Orban Optimod 8000s. And here we've been talking about the guy. I mentioned his name a couple times. Let's introduce him. Uh, it, is, um, it is Bob Orban from uh, Orban.com and the Orban Processor uh, Company. Uh, hi, good evening, Bob. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. Well, it is, it is our pleasure, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we, uh, before you on the show, had uh, some of your friends like Bill Sachs and Greg Oganowski, and, uh, and now we've got you on the show. I'm looking forward to this next hour where we will really get to talk about some of the innards of, of audio processing. Um, we're going to actually, we're going to try to scoot through a little bit of history here pretty fast and, uh, and, and talk about, you know, some of the, the developments that, uh, that, that you've come up with. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to ask you, Bob, right away is um, uh, the, the very first product that you came up with, and that's the stereo synthesizer. We were talking in the pre-show 
about uh, the fact that this was a product that, that I used on a station. Um, I had a radio station that we, we had bought in Mississippi. It was an FM station. And at, at that exact moment, we had to take control of the station and put up a studio transmitter link, uh, 950 megahertz link. The only one we had was purely mono. It wouldn't carry the FM stereo baseband. And we, and we had to produce our programming uh, over in Cleveland, Mississippi. The transmitter was over in Drew, Mississippi. And uh, mono was all we had. So at the transmitter site, we took this mono audio, ran it into an Orban stereo synthesizer and out of that box out of that stereo synthesizer came a reasonable facsimile of a, a believable stereo signal which then went into our audio processor which was an orban uh, 8000 and then in, in, in the transmitter what what was your idea in coming up with with uh, with such a box bob uh, i had uh, actually worked on that at the uh, student radio station at princeton uh, the reason being that we had a uh, top 40 show from uh, 4 to 6 p.m. and uh, we had a FM stereo signal and very few of the uh, singles were being mixed in stereo at the time. There was often a uh, album version that was uh, sort of a throwaway mix but uh, the uh, sound of the single was the sound of mono so we wanted to be able to uh, have a uh, sort of accurate uh, Top 40 show that was also uh, stereo, and to do that, uh, I needed something that would spread out the mono a little bit, and still have uh, mono compatibility. Mm. Uh, and it occurred to me that the uh, way to do this might be to uh, basically synthesize a stereo different signal with an all-pass filter. An all-pass filter is just a phase shifter. Uh, if you measure the frequency response, it's flat, but if you measure the phase response, uh, it's very non-flat. And if you uh, create an artificial L minus R, it turns out that not only is the uh, signal mono compatible uh, in mono radios, but also the uh, sum of the power spectra of the left and right channels are same as the power spectrum of the mono. So regardless of whether you're listening in mono or stereo, you still get the uh, same frequency balance and it's the balance that you associate with a hit. Wow, okay. I, I didn't know all those factors went into synthesizing stereo. And you said something that, that you know, we as broadcast engineers toss around quite a bit, but let's introduce our audience, uh, those who may not uh, know of this concept, mono compatible. What does that mean, and, and, and why would you be... What happens if something's not mono-compatible? Uh, in uh, radio, bad things happen. People think, well, you know, FM radio is stereo. The uh, fact is that uh, every auto radio uh, has a blend function in it, and usually what it does is it looks at some metric of the RF channel, whether it's signal strength or multipath or something, and will blend the stereo channels back to mono if the uh, signal gets too bad. So to this very day, uh, mono compatibility is still a very important aspect uh, in a uh, you know radio ready mix. Gotcha, gotcha. I would imagine that myself and um, uh, Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin, a uh, uh, co-host on the show here. I'm guessing that all of us became uh, familiar with Orban, uh, with the Orban 8000. At least that was my first one. Maybe Chris Tarr being the, the, the young buck here, maybe he uh, started with the 8100. Chris Tarr, what, what's, what was your first experience with an Orban? Actually, it was, uh, it was uh, well, the, yeah, the first Orban was, was an 8000. But I, I seem to remember there may have been uh, a Duro DAP in front of it. I I, sure. I do remember there was something ahead of it. I don't remember what, but I was just a child when I when I saw that. <laughs> well, actually, I've I walked into engineering at, at some stations where people thought they needed to put a uh, a what the 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 UREI uh, LA4 in front of the Optimod 8000, uh, and then people also thought they needed to put the um, CP803 composite clipper after the 8000. So, and oftentimes. Why? You know, the, the, uh, the Orban Optimod 8000 was sandwiched between other stuff. Oh, uh, I think so that, that, that's, that's gone on for years. I mean, look at how many people have stacked sure. things like, you know, multiple uh, volume acts and, and automaxes uh, on a chain. 
So I, I want to go to a basic uh, question here for, for Bob. You know, prior to your development of the 8000 and, and you know, the original Optimata F FM, Bob, I, I think you've explained uh, on the Triangulation Show and in other venues that before that time, the processor and the stereo generator for FM were different boxes. Yes. And maybe you could walk us through that a bit. And why did you have this idea that that's not the best way to do it? Well, uh, the FCC rules were quite strict at the time. They required transmitters to be uh, type accepted, I think it was. I never remember the difference between type accepted and type approved, except that I know one of them you actually had to uh, uh, send the uh, send the box to the commission for uh, measurement. The other one you could do the measurements yourself, if I recall correctly. But the point being that the stereo generator was part of the transmitter, so the stereo generator was type accepted. And r about the time that the uh, 8000 was developed, uh, Mosley came out with its first composite STL. Uh, so this was something new in the uh, signal path. It was a output of a stereo generator that went over a microwave link and thence to the transmitter. Uh, so the FCC finally sort of got the idea that maybe it's okay to uh, disengage the uh, stereo generator from the transmitter. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric Small uh, took this idea and uh, ran with it. Uh, he uh, basically took the uh, I, the idea of the 8000 down to the FCC. I think he talked to Harold Cassens, who was a major engineer at the time, and persuaded him that if we did uh, type acceptance measurements on the stereo generator inside the 8000, that there should be a general approval that that could be used with the uh, exciter, the FM exciter within the transmitter. Uh, in addition, uh, there was just a very long uh, tradition of uh, starting with something like an AGC or a compressor, and then the peak limiter was a separate box, uh, could even be a different brand, like some people would use uh, an Automax with a uh, the automax being the compressor, using that with a, uh, you know, a GE look ahead limiter or uh, Collins. Uh, and then the, there was another wire at the output of the limiter, and that would go into the transmitter, which was implicitly the stereo generator. And all of these uh, wires and uh, interfaces were non ideal. First of all, it was easy to really mess up the uh, adjustment so that you could actually get uh, headroom issues in the circuits. Uh, and second of all, as I uh, discussed with uh, Leo a while back, uh, the uh, low-pass filters in the uh, stereo generator would overshoot and ring. And mm. this was the main cause of loss of peak modulation. Uh, or I should say loss of average modulation. It was an increase in peak modulation caused by the uh, overshoot and ringing. Sure. Uh, so the opportunity arose to put all of the stuff under control, uh, put raw audio into one side of the Optimod, take a uh, FM stereo composite out the other side. Uh, we got rid of the ringing and the 15 kilohertz uh, low-pass filters, and we got rid of any interface problems just uh, caused by, say, a, a level or you know, uh, transformer problem between uh, the limiter and the stereo generator. Uh, we had one set of uh, transformers and an 8000. They were at the input. After that, it was pretty much direct coupled, as I recall. Uh, so it also had no problem with low frequency bounce and tilt to speak of. Uh, that's, that's another issue, uh, which we could get into later if you want. But uh, basically, the fact that uh, the transmitter had a response to 50 hertz, which was all the FCC required, uh, was insufficient to preserve uh, the peak modulation control of highly uh, processed audio. And uh, 
In fact, it turns out that uh, you need to have significant response down to 0.16 hertz, 0, 0.16, oh. uh, in order to uh, have a minimal amount of low frequency tilt and to get the best amount of modulation control. And the uh, 8000, if I recall correctly, had only one coupling capacitor, which was at the output of the stereo generator. I do not think it was quite 0.16 because we hadn't done the uh, math on it at that point, but it was uh, it was down there. And uh, so 8000s did control modulation pretty tightly. Can, can you help me understand one thing? I've not, uh, you know, with AM transmitters, I've understood a low frequency tilt that the uh, uh, the AM transmitter modulator and, and amplifiers may not be able to, you know, maintain a square wave that's a low frequency. But what is what is low frequency tilt in, in the world of FM modulation? What does that look like and how does it manifest itself and that, why does it cause a problem? Well, the uh, moment that you uh, get clipping into the picture, uh, you start to uh, make square like square wave like uh, audio waveforms and if you happen to have uh, a lot of bass energy uh, and you hit the uh, clipper uh, you get something that flat tops and it may flat top for a relatively long time interval uh, technically speaking you're actually generating difference frequency intermodulation uh, below the uh, frequency range of the input audio uh, but mainly, uh, tilt is important because uh, you do clipping-like operations. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more complicated th than that when you get into the, the details because uh, the, uh, the high-pass filter that uh, you get when you just create a uh, series uh, capacitor and resistor to ground, uh, that has an associated uh, phase shift with it. And even if you don't hard clip a waveform, you can still uh, change the uh, phase relationship between low frequency uh, energy. Uh, if you have more than one frequency component you know, down below 100 hertz, you need to have those all lined up in a certain way in time in order to uh, avoid having overshoot happen. So you want to avoid phase shift uh, in addition to uh, just uh, dealing with the, the issue of the different frequency I am down there. You know, I, I've got one more question before uh, I'm, uh, I think Chris uh, Tobin has a question he's going to ask. But uh, here's, here's mine. When you were designing um, the, the Orban 8000 um, or, you know, your, your first real FM processor here, what, were, were you at the time working with... Um, what was considered state-of-the-art integrated circuits, and, and were, you, were you developing circuit designs that were maybe not in a textbook, that were, that were improvements on what ha had been taught in, in, in electronics courses? Uh, I had uh, introduced ICs into the picture fairly early. Uh, Fairchild came out with a uh, IC op amp called the 709, and the 709 had a bunch of problems, but one thing that was good about it was it has a, had a very simple input stage, and the input stage was uh, quite low noise. Uh, 709's big problems were, first of all, that it needed to be externally compensated, and mm. uh, second of all, that it had a Class B output stage, so you'd get a lot of crossover distortion. Uh, but it was possible to uh, put a uh, pull-down resistor uh, at the output of the op amp to the negative 15 supply to bias into class A. And then you had yourself a pretty linear low noise amplifier. And in fact, we use 709s as the buffer amps for our uh, FET gain control elements in the original 8000. The uh, signal level uh, in a processor like that actually goes down to about 20 millivolts or so. It's really sort of almost phono cartridge level. Mm. So you have to uh, do quite a bit of low noise design to get it to work very well. And as I recall, we were able to get something in the order of uh, 80 dB noise floor in, in the device and much lower input to output uh, distortion than 
the uh, previous uh, generation of processing could do, mainly because uh, we didn't have any transformers in the past and because uh, we used uh, IC op amps instead of uh, discrete transistor amplifiers. In the chat room, um, Navion reminds us that these were typically in a, in a can uh, with eight leads coming out of them. Isn't that right? That's absolutely correct. Wow. Uh, the uh, the eighth pin uh, dips really didn't come out until a while later. Uh, originally, the uh, these IC op amps were quite expensive. Uh, Fairchild made them in two temperature ranges, one for commercial and one for military. Uh, but for the sake of uh, reliability, uh, they wanted to uh, keep the uh, chips hermetically sealed so that there was no possibility of having uh, moisture uh, leak into the, uh, the chip and compromise the integrity of the metallization or the, the, the leads going to the final uh, eight big wires coming out. So uh, that was really the history behind the metal cans and the uh, eight pin uh, dips were a cost reduction uh, measure. Uh, but we actually got bit really bad by some 4558s, uh, which we used a lot in the uh, early Orban products. Uh, I forget the, whether it was a national or somebody had moved the uh, line, I think, to Mexico, and uh, they had some contamination, and they created basically time bombs that would work for a couple of hundred hours, and then they would just go belly up. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, you know, some painful learning experience. Uh, fortunately, the uh, IC manufacturing industry has greatly moved on since those days. Um, Chris Tobin. I think you had a question from your perspective in, in New York City, where you surely have uh, cut your teeth with Optimods there. Oh, Optimods, yes, definitely. From uh, my uh, college days, where we had the Mike DeRoe box, and then we had the 8000. And here in New York City, in the metro, it's, uh, you know, it was always about loudness wars, which I don't think has changed any. But one thing I wanted to ask was the design. Um, back in my early days in my career, I did a lot of patent reading. So I read the patents on your boxes, and they're absolutely genius. How did you come to the idea of a smart clipper in the 8100? I'll move forward from the 8000 to the 8100 series. And, you know, the, the idea behind that and the way you did it, I know there's a lot of little black epoxy boxes on the circuit board. But just the, the you know, how did you even think to, you know, go in that direction, realize what you can benefit from and how you can make basically the, the works in the drawer box just, you know, the ultimate when it comes to, you know, being competitive, being soft, being, I mean, everything about it. But it's just brilliant, the whole design. I'm just curious. The, the smart clipper has always fascinated me. I've always worked around it and, and morphed it into other things, you know, moved it around with other boxes, as Chris Tarr was saying. So how did, how did you think about that? Or, you know, just something you came up with one day in the backyard and just, or sitting with a piece of paper? Just curious. Uh, that uh, set of ideas actually started with Optron AM 9000. Uh, oh. I had uh, decided to try to put a steep slope equalizer in our first AM processor to somewhat equalize out the uh, two kilohertz slopes that uh, typically were found in the IF stages of the uh, core radios of the day. And when I tried to uh, run a pre-emphasized signal like that into a hard clipper, uh, it sounded awful. And uh, you got the, the S's turning into F's, uh, as I discussed on the previous uh, show here. Oh, yeah, yeah. With Leo, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, what would happen if I low-pass filtered the distortion coming out of the clipper, and then subtracted it from the clipped signal, uh, thereby canceling the clipper distortion, you know, below about two kilohertz. Uh, originally. Uh, this was done with uh, analog bucket brigade delays because the low pass filter at two kilohertz had a fairly large group delay, particularly uh, because there was some uh, group delay equalization in it. So that uh, was the start of the uh, of, of the smart clipper. 
the uh, 9000 actually also had a psychoacoustic model in it. Uh, there were a lot of interesting new ideas in that box. We uh, above two kilohertz, we uh, divided the uh, mid-range into I think it was five or six uh, third octave bands, and we looked at the uh, ratio of the distortion signal caused by the clipper to the undistorted signal. So we estimated whether the uh, clipping distortion would be psychoacoustically masked and then we used a sort of uh, look ahead limiter design so that uh, the drive level to the main clipper in the box could be actually turned down before it produced the distortion. Uh, and this was you know, pretty hot stuff at the time because this was 1977 and these ideas were later used in uh, audio codex, but uh, that really didn't start to be well known until I think around 1979 to 1980. Uh, so going from the 9000 to the 8100, uh, the problem with bucket brigades is that they had uh, you know, limited noise and distortion performance. It was fine for AM, but uh, not what we would want to have for FM. So occurred to me that uh, you could use the 15 kilohertz low-pass filter uh, of the Optimod as the matching delay element for the 2 kilohertz distortion canceling filter. Uh, required a lot of group delay equalization, some fairly fancy mathematics to uh, design the filters. They were all numerically optimized. Uh, but the result was that we got uh, typically around 30 dB of cancellation and because there was no uh, bucket brigade in, in the system we were able to get a very high quality audio path. You know, that was a brilliant design, I have to say, and it's still to this day is still a brilliant design. Well, thank you. Uh, Chris Starr, you had a, a question you were uh, raising your hand yeah, over. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a combination technical and philosophical. I've been a big, uh, a, a big follower of yours for a long, long time, and I, I studied a lot of your white papers. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I still do to this day when I set audio processing and have intelligent discussions with my program directors about is something you put, and I believe it was even as far back as the 8000 manual, or in one of your white papers about, you know, the, the audio in your plant, you always talked about how car, you know, radios have a volume control but they don't have a, a control to undo distortion and, and things of those nature and I, you know I know that in the original design of the Optimize with the 8000 into the 8100 it was a conscious decision on your part to limit the amount of controls available uh, you know it was one of those where you know you didn't it, 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 in other words it was very hard to make an 8000 or 8100 sound bad you, know, you would have to really work at it to, to make them sound bad now we go progressively on through the 8200, 8400, 8500, 8600, and you know it's gotten to the point now where if you really want to get down to granular controls, uh, you can you can do that on an 8500. There is a whole lot of things you can you can adjust on those systems. Um, how do you feel about that? You know, because I, I, again, you're you're you know you're you're a hi-fi guy, and and you've always been about uh, quality over loudness. You know, loudness has not been the big thing. I mean, it's been part of it for competitive reasons, but I know that that personally, you're into the you know to to a nice, high-quality musical sound. Uh, was it uh, and and without uh, you know having to go too in depth. Has that been difficult to release some of that control to people, knowing that it could be used for evil as opposed to good? Uh, it uh, took a while to get used to it. Um, I, I do happen to agree with uh, Steve Jobs about the importance of the user experience. And one of the reasons why the uh, 8000 and the 8100 had as few controls as they did was exactly what you said, that uh, it was very hard to make them sound bad. And even when we uh, added the X-T2 uh, accessory chassis to the 8100, uh, that didn't have a huge number of controls available. It wasn't until our first DSP-based processor, the 8200, that I felt that we could uh, 
take advantage of dig digital technology uh, to keep the user interface and experience simple and elegant while still offering more control to the user. So one of the, well, the, the two main things that we introduced for the 8200 were first of all, a uh, quick setup, which was a wizard-like uh, guided setup that uh, took you through from the beginning to, to the end and hopefully got you on the air with a uh, appropriate sound for your format. Uh, and the second important thing was uh, one knob less more control. Uh, you know, under the hood using uh, digital uh, processing, we sort of conceptually had about you know, 50 different rubber bands and uh, belts moving all the controls. Uh, but we had already optimized the, uh, what are really a, a family of presets uh, under one factory preset name so that you could trade off loudness against distortion uh, while still maintaining the optimum tra trade off and not getting too far afield. Uh, as we moved forward with the 8400, 8500, and 8600, uh, we had to uh, respond to the realities of the marketplace, which were that uh, competing processors were giving more of these controls to the users. But we always kept quick setup, and we always kept less more. So that uh, the, the ideal of the uh, bulletproof processor hopefully has been uh, carried through right, right up to our current product line. I'm mute there. Fantastic. Uh, now, and just a quick follow-up, too. Um, with uh, with your, your I, I, again, I, you know, I've talked about your training in the past. There is a very different sound between an Optimod and even, you know, and, and, and Omnia and, and all these different kinds of processors. And, um, you know, I, I describe, uh, you know, the, the, the Optimod as having kind of a, a very fullish sound. And I'm just wondering, in, in your design, is there kind of a certain sound that you, you kind of have, that you have in your head. I, I seem to think that over the years, although some of the controls have changed and the amount of loudness and things have changed, the overall sound of an Optimod has always kind of been the same. You know, it's always been a kind of a musical thing as opposed to, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, the Omnia, for example, has a very specific sound. It's also musical, but in a different way. And, and there's a very distinct difference there. And I, I'm wondering, is that uh, kind of just based on you know, you have in your head kind of an ideal radio station sound. Do you design to that? Uh, that's a, a complicated question. Um, I've known uh, Greg Oganowski, who is our VP of uh, new pro product development for a long time, and uh, he and I uh, share a lot of preference when it comes to the sound of radio stations. So uh, my original... Uh, multi-band uh, processor was the 8000. It had six bands uh, and it used steep crossover slopes which uh, allowed the uh, processor to do quite a bit of automatic re-equalization of the program material. Uh, the crossovers were all pass. They weren't phase linear which is uh, something that uh, comes with that territory. It means that the uh, crossover points are at minus 3 dB and not minus 6. Uh, so some of the fatness of the Optimod sound is still a secret sauce, but some of it has to do with the fact that we typically use all-pass crossovers and steep, uh, steep slope crossovers, uh, except for the digital radio processors where uh, we do use uh, steep slope crossovers, but they are uh, phase linear. I don't hear Kirk. Uh, Can't hear you, Kirk. <laughs> how about that? There we Much go. Much better. I'll learn how to use this Skype one day. Bob, I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about this, uh, this trade-off between distortion and loudness. And I know a lot of us as engineers get that because loudness you know, can be made from, from distortion. That's what helps, help us perceive that. Um, 
what what can we as engineers how do we talk to uh program directors about this trade-off and yeah how, yeah how, how do you know when when the distortion is 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 too much there was a <laughs> there was a guy at a radio station here in nashville who was talking to his engineer about about distortion and the, the engineer was very wanted a very clean sound and the program director always wanted something louder something louder something louder and um there's a story that the the program director was drinking a cup of coffee, and the uh, the engineer knew that the start this discussion was going to happen. So he brought in a little bottle with a dropper in it, and um, uh, they had this discussion. And the the engineer said, "Well, tell you what I'll do." And he opened this bottle dropper. He says, "I've got a bottle here full of urine, and I'm going to start dipping it into, dropping it into your cup of coffee, and you tell me when to stop." <laughs> so, what? Well, don't do that. Well, that's like distortion and loudness. Now, how much distortion do you want? What are your thoughts on that, Bob? Uh, it depends on the format. I think that the uh, most careful research ever done in the history of this business on that trade-off was done by Jim Schulke, uh, mm. who was the beautiful music syndicator who uh, controlled literally every aspect of the air chain, uh, all the way from the uh, playout system through the console, through the... Uh, audio processor through the transmitter through the antennas he he felt that different antennas sounded different uh, i don't know how much of this was imagination and how much was you know one antenna might have a little more uh you know visual than the other which causes more incidental am and on and on you could mm -hmm. talk about that all day but uh he uh, managed to have an awful lot of number one radio stations uh, I think that a lot of the problems with PDs asking for distortion is that often the audio processing is the least researched part of the air sound. Uh, mm -hmm. That the program material is researched, they may do call outs, they, you know, they may do this and that, but you don't hear very often uh, people being taken into focus groups and being asked to uh, listen to various amounts of distortion in the audio processing. So you sort of have to uh, you know, make some generalizations about uh, format versus the amount of distortion. Uh, you want to uh, increase time spent listening conventional wisdom is that you uh, reduce the amount of distortion uh, increasing cum uh, conventional wisdom is you can tolerate more distortion for the sake of loudness if you only want to hear if i want people to listen for 10 to 15 minutes at a time uh, but i think a lot of it is uh you know urban legends a lot of it's uh, gut feel um, a lot of it is the least scientific part of, of radio programming at this point. How much of what we, you know, as an engineer, I grew up really under, thinking I understood this trade-off between loudness and, and distortion. And yet, I believe that uh, both Orban and, and, and Omni and maybe some other companies, too, are learning about how to get louder and louder and louder while controlling or hiding or mitigating the distortion in, in certain ways. What are your thoughts about that uh, comment? Uh, well, it's true. Um, our latest FM processor uses a psychoacoustic model to uh, improve the uh, loudness distortion trade-off by quite a bit. It's uh, similar to uh, the psychoacoustic models used in many of the uh, psychoacoustic codecs these days. Uh, its ancestor really is the 8000, where we did it for the first time. Uh, but by building more and more intelligence, uh, in other words, information about how the ear actually uh, perceives distortion into the uh, processing, we can uh, improve the uh, trade-off in a way that was previously just impossible. Uh, Bob, in about 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to run out of time, and that's a, such a shame because I, I know that there are engineers out there uh, listening and, and watching who would love to hear so much more. Here's a, a question that's always been on my mind, and it's, it, I guess it harkens back to the days when you guys started developing the uh, the 8200 uh, uh, processor. 
and and I know you've you've talked about this in some of the the forums um, in in broadcasting some of the listservs. What's it like designing audio processing in DSP instead of with analog circuits? And I want to add that. A few, little while ago, you were talking about these, you know, numerically uh, optimized uh, filters that you were designing, and that was all in analog that you were talking about at that point. Uh, can, what? I mean, how is how is the world different when you get to use DSP? And maybe even, uh, if, is there anything worse about designing in DSP than in analog? Uh, that's a that's another uh, lengthy discussion. Uh, originally, uh, we. We're designing the 8200 to pretty much model uh, what we had done in analog processing. We're, we were able to uh, take advantage of a few things that you could do in DSP, particularly uh, phase linear filters that were impossible. But uh, the limited number of uh, machine cycles available from the early 56,001 DSP chips uh, limited what we could do. At the same time, uh, I needed to educate myself, uh, so I bought some DSP textbooks and read some papers and uh, learned to get comfortable in what we call the Z-plane as opposed to the S-plane in analog. Uh, we originally had hired a uh, DSP engineer. I learned quite a bit from him. Uh, but uh, eventually I was able to uh, do a lot of this stuff on my own. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, computers got faster and faster, so I started actually uh, prototyping DSP algorithms in Fortran, of all things. Uh, and I have a development system that allows me to do real-time uh, processing. Uh, Fortran creates a DLL, and that's called by a uh, C console application. Uh, so. That is really great because you can make changes, you can recompile in a matter of seconds, and you can listen to the results. Uh, you don't have to worry about a hot soldering iron. You don't have to worry about plug boards as we used to do with resistors and capacitors. So from that point of view, it has been uh, very liberating. And it's also been liberating in the sense that we could do things that were so complicated that if we had tried to do them in analog, we never could have uh, built a reliable processor. It would have just had too many parts. Gotcha, gotcha. So now that DSP design techniques are, you know, what an, another, what, 10 or 12 or 14 years old uh, from when you were designing the 8200, uh, what conveniences have come about for you now? Can you do a whole lot more now than you could with your design tools of the 8200? Uh, yeah, we certainly can. The, uh, the, the, the new limiter technology in the 8600 uh, takes far more machine cycles than the entire 8200. I think I worked it out, and there, there's something like uh, 25 times the uh, DSP power uh, in an 8600 that, that there was in the 8200. Uh, so, you know, it's been liberating because anything, virtually anything you can imagine now. Uh, you can put in DSP and you can make a processor that will sell at a price that the market will, will bear. Uh, the constant reduction in cost of DSP has been extraordinary. Mm. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, just been a great thing for me as a designer. I, I certainly do not have any uh, analog nostalgia. I, I would never want to go back to the constraints <laughs> of analog when it comes to doing audio processing for radio or, or digi you know, digital radio, the internet, etc. Well, certainly there are some okay. folks who just who do have analog nostalgia. They love it, and one of them is, is one of our fans and friends, of uh, uh, Bill Sachs. And I, I mean, I, of course, we all kind of get get a warm heart when we see a, a, a device with glowing tubes in it. You know, that that that's always a, a, a fun fun thing. Uh, unfortunately, I got to pause right now and tell you that we're going to continue our conversation with Bob Orban. Um, and we've got some great questions and comments coming in the chat room. And also, uh, uh, Chris Tarr, I believe, is going to have the next question for us. But we're going to take a, a quick uh, a listen to uh, a message from my employer and the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. And that's Telos Systems and the Telos HX1 
digital telephone hybrid. You know, tell us, well, the phone hybrid was the very first thing that, that Steve Church uh, uh, experimented with and built back in, uh, in the early 1980s, 83 or 84 or so, and then ended up becoming a commercial product. Uh, you know, not so different than, than Bob Warband's own experience in the processor field uh, some years before that. Well, technology has come a long way, as, as Bob indicated, that DSPs get more and more powerful, and also our knowledge of, of just what the, the little things, the, the little frustrating things that we're still dealing with in processing something as, seemingly as simple as a phone call, uh, we're getting better and better at that. And the Telos HX1 honestly represents the highest and best from Telos in terms of processing a telephone call under a huge variety of conditions. Whether you're talking to somebody halfway around the planet or a cell phone on the next block, the challenges are, are quite different in these different scenarios. And yet the Telos HX1, it's DSP technology and the, the software, the firmware that we put in there uh, is able to deal with uh, these differences in, in phone connections. You know, we, we, we still have to send a little burst of, of, of noise, a uh, very, very special burst of noise that Telos sends to the caller to see what comes back from uh, what is reflected back from the various uh, analog or digital hybrids uh, along the way to that caller. And then we're able to um, do an extra good job of nulling out uh, those reflections that come back. So when, when a disc jockey is talking, when a talk show host is talking, when the sports show host is talking and talking to the caller, you don't hear any audio any of that audio coming back from the caller. And that's always been the problem with phone lines, is getting rid of this audio that comes back. And the, the figure of merit uh, that we're talking about here is something called trans-hybrid loss. And through, honestly, a, a great engineering and a few little tricks up our sleeves, we're able to achieve an enormous trans-hybrid loss, even on POTS phone lines, even on long-distance calls, and even on calls going to people who are using, say, a VoIP service like Vonage, um, or they're using a cell phone, and there's a lot of delay involved. I should add that... Um, uh, the Telos HX1 has an extra long uh, time period that it analyzes the, the, the call, something that the earlier Telos hybrids, like a like a, a Telos 1, weren't doing because those were developed in the days before there were uh, digi uh, digital cell phones and, and VoIP calls, which do add that extra delay. So check out the Telos HX1 on the Telos website. Um, there's the HX1 and the HX2. The one is obviously one telephone hybrid. It's got room to plug one phone line into it. You can also plug a phone set into it so you can make your uh, outgoing calls or talk to somebody not on the hybrid. Then there's the HX2, which has two Telos hybrids in it. Uh, they also can be cross-connected internally for conferencing. So you can actually supply just one mix minus audio from your console into a Telos HX2 and uh, say caller A will hear your mix minus plus caller B because that's done inside the, the HX2, and caller B will hear the mix minus audio plus caller A. So they're conferenced without having to have an overcomplicated audio console that's providing two mix minuses and maybe some complicated wiring, too. So check it out, the Telos HX series. Oh, these have uh, processing in them, some audio processing, and some extra tricks to really reduce the chance of feedback. Um, for example, the audio that's sent to the caller is actually pitch shifted downwards by a few hertz so as to reduce uh, the chance of, of audio, uh, acoustically coupled feedback from the other end. Hey, if you're in a TV studio, you have open mics and open speakers, the Telos HX1 works great in that environment as well. Plus, it does handle the variety of telephone standards, POTS telephone standards around the world. The chipset in it is designed to work with just any country you can name. Uh, there's, a, there's a dip switch setting to handle the the voltage, the the ring cadence, uh, the dial, the, you know, the, just uh, the the battery voltage, whether it's reversal or not, all those different things, the, the loop current, uh, the 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 interrupt uh, cadence, all that stuff is is built right into the HX1. And at the end of the show, we're going to give one of these HX1s away. If you have retweeted my announcement that the show was going to start or that Bob Orban was going to be on the show, I made about mm, four or five announcements uh, today on Twitter. If you follow me at K Harnack and you retweeted you are eligible to win. So we'll find out who the winner is in just a few minutes. All right, on with the show. Let's uh, hear from uh, Chris Tarr. Chris, you had, a, I think, a question for Bob Orban. By the way, Bob Orban is our guest, and he's with uh, the Orban Audio Processing Company at Orban.com. Chris, go ahead. 
a question slash comment. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things we were talking about a little earlier with, with audio processing and program directors and, and things like that, I think one of the things that we run into nowadays is what we now see with the digital processing and the cleanliness that it brings that what uh, kind of was a signature sound, let's say, back in the 70s and 80s was really a whole lot of distortion. Uh, you know, it was it was making you know creating square waves and, and rolling audio off at you know sometimes depending on the components used, 12, 13 kilohertz. Uh, you know, bad uh, audio, uh, bad, bad exciters, uh, that sort of thing. And I think one of the challenges, and I guess that's that's the question part for Bob is I think probably one of the challenges has got to be, the fact that um, you know in the 70, 60s, 70s, 80s we had this big wall of sound. Unfortunately, that wall was a whole lot of distortion. Uh, based on every you know, all the everything being cranked up and, and the lack of cleanliness in the audio, and it was a, a challenge for me is is kind of retraining our program directors that loud you know uh, there's a difference between that kind of flat brick wall uh, you know ripple loud and a nice clean loud and uh, I remember when I went from, from my anal first time I went from an analog processor to a digital processor the the very first thing they said is wow that's stunning. The second thing is, it just doesn't seem quite as loud. When actually, if you look at it, it was. And after a couple of days and they got used to the difference, they, they realized, yeah, actually, that's, you know, there's some dynamics there. Uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, Bob, when you first came out with, uh, I, I probably not as much the 8200, but say the 8400, uh, w were those some of the comments you got? Like, it was just, it's, it's almost like it's a totally different way of doing things now, a totally different sound. Well... <sighs> Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's plenty of ways of creating a wall of sound without using uh, a lot of clipping. Uh, when you have uh, a five or six band limiter and you get into it heavily and you use uh, fast release times, uh, you can get a sort of compressor wall of sound that has its own problems, I think, in terms of fatigue, but it doesn't necessarily sound distorted in the way that uh, clipping distortion does. Uh, so th it's just a different set of tools in the toolkit. But, uh, you know, one message that I would have for program directors or anybody else who wants to overprocess uh, is simply that this, that uh, when everything is loud, nothing is loud. Because Loudness it only exists as a relative uh, sensation uh, compared to quiet. So getting some dynamics back into the program, uh, I think, is a very positive thing. Uh, I think it is likely to uh, keep people listening longer, and uh, I think it is likely to be more musically involving. It's more likely to get listeners more emotionally involved with the broadcast. I think it's, I sometimes compare it to salt. You know, if you put a little salt on your dish, it tastes really, really good. Put a lot of salt on your dish and it tastes awful. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, audio processing is kind of the same way. You know, a little bit, is, it goes a long way. And uh, and I, I always like to kind of practice addition by subtraction. And uh, sometimes you can get a much louder sound actually by dialing things down just a little bit and putting it in a little more dynamic range. So I just, I just know the difference, especially between you know, the progression between the 8100 through the 8500, uh, it's amazing the things I can do now with an audio processor that I couldn't do back then, the, the type of, of sound I can create that's, that still is, is very powerful yet. Uh, and, and I know the, I, I, the Omni 11 and, and even the Omni series is very good at this, creating a, a very open sound yet very stunning and, and, and jumping through the speakers kind of thing. And, and I, I, I think the world is certainly better for your designs and and, uh, and for Frank's designs and, and the, the the evolution of DSP because we went from having, you know, fairly low, you know, for the time it was it was pretty progressive stuff. But you listen to the the progression in audio quality over the years and the and FM especially, you know, sounds so much better now with the the quality of the audio process that we can do now and the tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, it's just interesting to see how that's progressed over the years. I got a, a question for Bob. I, I, Bob. I, in some forums, you have mentioned from time to time that you like to go to classical music concerts to um, calibrate your ears and to kind of rem remind yourself of what, uh, you know, what the real world sounds like. How does that practice, uh, how can an engineer use that practice to uh, uh, evaluate or calibrate his ears 
for his own radio station in light of the r real world dynamics of we got to be loud, we got to be bright, we got to be dynamic. How does that work? Uh, you know, I think it is uh, almost two different things. Uh, the calibration of one's ears uh, with acoustic music shows you basically the ideal uh, where there is no electronic amplification at all. Uh, even if you go out to uh, you know, a jazz club or a rock club, you're likely to hear a lot of uh, electric instruments, and you're also likely to hear a PA where the individual sources have been mixed together. Uh, so, you know, I uh, grew up with classical music. I uh, did a classical music show for four years at the student radio station. Uh, and it sort of sets the end stop, if you will, for what can be uh, done musically when there is almost unlimited amounts of dynamic range and absolutely no electronics that get in the way. Uh, I think that uh, anybody adjusting a radio station, though, also has to uh, go to a live uh, rock or jazz or, you know, rap, uh, hip-hop, uh, raves, whatever, uh, just to get used to what people are listening to that's not on the radio. Mm. And somehow you need to try to integrate all of this stuff and uh, use it to uh, calibrate your taste when you're finally setting up the processing. Can, can you... Um can you adjust processing and can you develop algorithms while listening to music you really don't like? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. After a while, uh, I start listening to uh, the problematic parts of the music, uh, technically. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, uh, have a whole bunch of stuff that uh, I use over and over again uh, because I am very familiar with things that can go wrong. Uh, I don't think I would ever listen to that music again for pleasure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it's, just, it's just a different way of listening. And, and some people say that, uh, are, are, we, uh, are we on? Because it looks like, okay, there, we're back. We uh, are streaming. Uh, Did we miss any of that? I, if you back up about maybe 15 seconds, I think we they w nobody will miss anything. Uh, we, are, we are back, sorry. Okay. We're talking about uh, music that you don't like and music that, that, oh, uh, right. that yeah. you know, breaks uh, the process. We, we as, as don't processor designers uh, tend to get into this uh, mode of uh, listening to sound for its own sake as opposed to uh, the, the musical aspect of it. But I'll say that one thing that... Uh, I, I do not uh, feel that a processor is finished until I can actually run my test material through it and can enjoy listening to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of this is just sort of, uh, I think, subconscious. Uh, it comes from you know, my own particular preference and uh, long experience and you know, who knows what else. Um, earlier, we were t we met, you mentioned about uh, uh, crossovers and 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 uh, how you know, we 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 understand that that for a long time now uh, we've been doing multiband audio processing. So there's a you know there's a little man with a volume control on the bass and a little man with a volume control on the mid range and so forth so on for the upper ranges. Um, and, and I've heard you and I've and I've heard um, uh, Frank Foti also talk about the design of of crossovers. Why is that so important? And what What's one of the first mistakes that a, uh, a, a newbie designer could make if he were designing a multiband audio processor? Uh, well, you know, I don't want to give uh, too much training to newbies because the next <laughs> thing you know, they're oldies and they're competing with you. But uh, I, I think that uh, it's a matter of... Uh, Looking at, the, looking at the details uh, and reading a lot, there's two essential categories of crossovers. There are all-pass crossovers and there are phase-linear crossovers. Uh, mm -hmm.
both of them have a flat frequency response when all of the bands have the same ga uh, gain. Uh, all pass crossovers, however, introduce an overall phase shift uh, into the to the sound, uh, whereas phase linear crossovers do not. Uh, Frank F Foti and I have disagreed with this uh, uh, or about this over a number of years, uh, but one of the Secrets of the fat Optimod sound is the use of uh, all-pass crossovers. I can say that, mm -hmm. and it's uh, you know no secret that we have done that ever since the days of the uh, 9000. Hey, what well, I guess kind of related to that because you, you've mentioned all-pass a few times. Um, can you help me understand what an all-pass filter has to do with removing asymmetry, and and why do you want to remove asymmetry? in an audio processor. Uh, yeah, uh, Leonard Kahn, I believe, accidentally discovered uh, in the course of making single sideband transmitters that the 90 degree phase difference networks that you needed to do to make analog uh, single sideband transmitters also had this fortuitous side effect of making the uh, waveforms of speech more symmetrical. Uh, and he uh, came out with a product called the Symmetropeak, uh, the, the first uh, all-pass uh, phase scrambler for, for t to uh, deal with vo vocal uh, asymmetry. Uh, the reason that it's good to uh, do this is that uh, applying an all-pass filter to a signal is the closest thing you get to a free lunch in audio processing because it's a so-called linear process, meaning that it doesn't introduce any new frequencies into the spectrum. Uh, many voices are as asymmetrical by as much as 6 dB. Uh, in the old days of AM, where you had an unlimited uh, amount of positive peak modulation permitted by commission rules, uh, some people use phase uh, flippers that would automatically move the uh, positive peak so that they uh, modulated the transmitter in the positive direction, but uh, FM does not have that. And moreover, at least in my experience, uh, it turns out that applying an all-pass uh, phase scrambler to make speech more symmetrical uh, before a clipper uh, sounds better than even taking advantage of uh, AM asymmetry. And considering that uh, the audible effect of these things is really very, very subtle, uh, unlikely to be noticed by any uh, everyday radio listener. Uh, you know, it's pretty much uh, a win-win. Mm. Okay. All right. We're going to have to wrap the show up here pretty soon, but Bob, I wonder if you might um, give us your your thoughts on on um, processing like right now and where it's going. And I, I guess we're really talking about about processing for codecs. This has become such an area where processor manufacturers are are um, you know trying to make some headway and trying to you know persuade uh, users of codecs that you know you need to process to get the most out of efficiency out of that codec so it sounds best at, at the other end. What are some of your, your big initial thoughts on, on, on that and where do you think we're going? Um, I think that uh, the uh, most important difference between processing for today's codecs and processing for AM FM is uh, the peak limiter technology that's used. Uh, the peak limiter technology for AM and FM is based on clipping in some sort of fancy way, often with you know psychoacoustic models or other elements to uh, remove as much of the distortion as you can, uh, but in uh, the uh, digital radio or internet processing, we use uh, local head limiting mostly because the uh, modulation sidebands uh, that are produced by the gain reduction uh, are very close to the uh, unprocessed uh, Fourier frequency components in the unprocessed audio. Uh, that means that they stay within a psychoacoustic critical band of the unprocessed audio, uh, where that is typically one-third of an octave. Uh, it means that unlike a clipper where you're throwing extra grunge throughout the spectrum, the uh, psychoacoustic model in the, in, in the uh, 
codec does not have to try to encode uh, this extra clipper distortion because with a look ahead limiter it's not there. Uh, it used to be that uh, there were other tricks that were useful for dealing with very low bit rate codecs, uh, particularly the old uh, Windows Media and so forth, but with the advent of uh, spectral uh, SBR, spectral band replication technology used in HEAAC and in the uh, HD radio codec, uh, that has become uh, less and less important because the, uh, the, the high frequencies now get uh, reconstituted in a much more efficient way than uh, mm. the older technology allowed them to be. Hmm. Okay, that's a, I hadn't hadn't thought about that. So an interesting take, and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm sure you're right. So uh, is the bottom line that you, you, it it actually becomes a bit easier to process for codecs because they're using spectral band replication? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it mm -hmm. gives the uh, broadcaster much more artistic leeway in how the processing mm -hmm. is set. Uh, it's still wise to try to keep uh, density fairly loose, not uh, use very fast release times in, in, in the compression mm -hmm. uh, because I think the codecs do respond better to uh, open sounding processing. But I, you know, I have to say that uh, at this point there's a real problem at the uh, mastering side and it's gotten to the point where I buy CDs and uh, I think uh, why did I do this? Because the last one I bought sounded horrible. I couldn't stand to listen to more than two cuts at once. And now this one does too. Uh, as you know, Frank and I wrote uh, a paper together uh, called uh, What Happens to My uh, Music When It's Heard on the Radio, I believe, or something very close to that, uh, where we described what happened? Uh, what happens to a uh, CD when it uh, is broadcast? And the bottom line is that what the industry really needs is radio mixes, or I should say, radio masters, where everything is the same except the uh, mastering engineer just pulls back the uh, drive level to his clippers and his uh, digital limiters by uh, six dB. And then you have a uh, radio master that basically has all of the coloration caused by compression and and equalization, whatever the uh, the mastering engineer puts in. But it is clean, and it's uh, is going to work much better uh, with transmission audio processors on the radio. That is a wonderful idea. Do we ever have a, a hope, a dream of uh, of getting that to happen in industry wide? Have a, have a radio mix. I mean, that, that's not just a shorter version, but actually is a better sounding version. Well, I would uh, hope that uh, somebody like Clear Channel could uh, come to Universal Music and say, hey, guys, uh, you're causing us a lot of problems. And all you need to do, and it, do it wouldn't cost very much, is to tell your mastering engineer to make two, you know, two takes of this uh, once at plus six and once at, at, at zero uh, and it's going to help sell your uh, product a lot better on our radio stations and it's going to be better for deal deal for everybody all the way around yep you're right Bob, I'm, I'm afraid we are absolutely out of time. We've used every last second that they're going to give us, and we, we are going to have to go. Uh, my co-hosts on the show here have been uh, Chris Tobin from New York City. Chris, thank you for being with us and adding to the show. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's an actual pleasure, and all the years I've done audio and uh, working in and out of transmitter sites, let's just say one constant has been the, uh, the Optimod, and I know of many folks who would, uh, who would kill to get an Optimod back on the air, the old analog ones as well. Uh, wherever they can. So, Bob, it's an absolute pleasure, and a genius behind your work is is a test of time. And uh, Chris Tarr is Chris Tarr still with us to say goodbye? I am. It has it has been a pleasure. I've been a, a <laughs> fan of Bob Orbans for years. I've been following his work, and uh, I'm like a little kid getting to talk to him tonight. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, Bob, for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. It, it has been great, Bob. Uh, thank you very much for for coming on, and. Uh, uh, 
appreciate the fact that uh, maybe Bill Sachs had some influence in getting you to come on and appreciate your drive up to Petaluma this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, quite welcome. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on This Week in Radio Tech. Our show today has been brought to you by Telos at telos-systems.com and the Telos HX1 telephone hybrid. Now, we're going to give one away right now to folks who have retweeted, and we got to do that real fast. Uh, Bob, I, I need a, a random number from you. Do you have a your random number generator ready? I need a random number between about 1 and 42. Um, I will take uh, 29 since that's been my preferred birthday for a long time. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see. One, two, three. No, we're not giving it to Chris Tarr. Thank you for retweeting, Chris. I appreciate that, but we're not giving you the... Uh, the All right. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I counted... Tw oh, my goodness. Um, wow. Uh, apparently a d deserving uh, a Twitter user. Uh, congratulations on winning the HX1 to uh, Toby Mai, who goes by Grumpy Tech, at Grumpy Tech, uh, retweeted this to uh, over 3,000 followers. Thank you very much, uh, Toby and Grumpy Tech. And uh, why don't you send me an email? Um, I'm easy to find, or send me a direct message on Twitter, and I, I'll get back in touch with you, and uh, we'll get you your uh, Telos HX1. Thanks again for uh, playing along, and thanks for your, your, uh, your attention. I think we're off next week, but we'll be back uh, the week after with another great guest, or maybe just uh, you know three or four of us uh, chatting about broadcast engineering. That's it for us. Uh, Burke, thank you, and thanks to all the people. We uh, thank you, and we'll see you next time on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.